Welcome to our first video for uh, the maintaining a balance topic. So the maintaining a balance topic is going to be looking at multicellular organisms, both plants and animals, and how they have specialised organ systems that are adapted for the uptake and transport of essential nutrients from the environment and using these nutrients for energy and the removal of waste products. The idea behind the Maintaining a Balance unit is to have a look at the different structures and processes that these multicellular organisms have in place in order to maintain a stable internal environment. So they need to be able to carry out a range of different things in order to keep, obviously, a balance. So the unit is broken up into three sections. The first one we are looking at is most organisms are active in a limited temperature range. So obviously for this section we'll be looking at how the temperature can affect an organism and the different processes that organisms have in place in order to maintain that temperature within this narrow range. So we're going to start off by having a look at four dot points, explain why the maintenance of a constant internal environment is important for optimal metabolic efficiency, describe homeostasis as the process by which organisms maintain a relatively stable internal environment, explain that homeostasis consists of two stages, detecting changes from the stable state and counteracting changes from the stable state, and outline the role of the nervous system in detecting and responding to environmental changes. So this may seem like quite a number of syllabus dot points to be having a look at but when we break it down our first one is a simple explain where we look at cause and effect then a describe looking at characteristics another explain looking cause and effect and outline so starting off uh, conditions within the body must be maintained at a constant level in order to achieve optimal metabolic efficiency so metabolism refers to all the chemical processes that take place in the body and efficiency simply means to be able to work well. Enzymes are responsible for controlling all the metabolic activities within cells and they will only operate within a limited range of temperature and acidity. So we need homeostasis to happen in order to make sure that those ranges are maintained. So what is homeostasis? Homeostasis is the process by which organisms maintain a relatively stable internal environment. So it depends, obviously, where the organism lives, what they need to do in order to maintain this internal environment. A steady internal environment is vital for the survival of all cells, as the chemical processes of life can only function within a narrow range of conditions. So that's our explain. So the cause and effect. The cause being, uh, if we have a change in the narrow range of conditions, the effect is that the organism is unable to maintain their relative state and therefore survival of the cells is impaired. So homeostasis consists of two stages, as the syllabus dot point tells us. So firstly, we need to be able to detect, to detect changes from the stable state. This is made possible by the presence of receptors in living organisms. Receptors of, in animals consist of nerve cells that detect stimuli. And as we remember from junior science, the stimulus is any information that brings about a response. So for uh, humans, can be things like the amount of light, the amount of so, so hearing a sound, feeling some pressure on your skin, some heat, uh, and they're detected by the specific receptors. So light is detected by photoreceptors in our eye, Temperature is detected by thermoreceptors in our skin. Receptors in plants usually include the shoot and root tips, working together with plant hormones. So once the change has been detected, our bodies and other organisms' bodies need to then counteract these changes to bring it back to the stable state. So this is brought about in living organisms by uh, structures called effectors. In mammals, effectors are usually muscles or glands, and in plants, hormones such as auxins and cytokinins act as effectors. Changes in an organism's surroundings are detected by the receptors, processed by a control center, which in our case is our brain, and counteracted by effectors. So let's have a look at this um, flowchart that shows how this happens. So we start off with a stimulus. The one we're going to have a look at in this example is an increase in the temperature. Increase in temperature is detected by thermoreceptors in our skin, which then send a message via the sensory neuron to our control center, 
which is our brain. The control centre then interprets the message, works out what needs to happen, sends a message along the motor neuron to the effector. In this case, the sweat glands and the blood vessels will be good examples of effectors. And the response that is brought about is sweating and vasodilation. So when somebody gets hot, their first or sort of the most visible responses that we see is they begin to sweat and they turn red. So obviously the sweating is brought about by the sweat glands releasing sweat and the going red is brought about by the blood vessels dilating, which increases the blood flow to the surface of our skin, which helps to decrease our body temperature. Now the fact that we're sweating, so our uh, the water is evaporating off our skin and helping to cool us down and vasodilation has taken place, we now have a new stimulus being formed. So the response brings about a new stimulus, which is usually the opposite to the original stimulus. Okay, so before our stimulus was the temperature increasing. Now with the sweating and the vasodilation, our temperature, temperature is beginning to decrease, decrease. Sorry, So the receptor will detect that and then send the message all the way around again and eventually the sweating and the vasodilation will stop because the temperature has returned back to normal. So in a feedback loop, the receptors detect the response and send messages back to the control centre to stop further adjustment. This is often referred to as a negative feedback because it results in a negative response by the effector, so the opposite of what already took place. So a feedback mechanism or a feedback loop shows us the links between the receptors and the effectors. So this picture shows us a really basic uh, sort of basis skeleton framework of a feedback mechanism. So we have our set value, which is uh, detected by our receptors, message goes to the control center, and then our regulators bring about the change and we bring it back to our set value. And this continues and continues and continues until this set value brings us back to homeostasis. So we mentioned negative feedback mechanisms. Negative feedback mechanisms result in a response that is opposite to the initial situation. So our temperature increasing or decreasing is a perfect example of a negative feedback mechanism. So we spoke about the fact that organisms need to maintain a narrow temperature range in order to function properly. So an example is, If we have a decrease in body temperature, so the decrease is the stimulus, causes the shivering, which is our response in the muscles, which bring about the response, so the effectors. This increases our body temperature, which is therefore our new stimulus, and then you stop shivering. So the new response has brought about um, a, sorry, a new response brings about a stimulus that is opposite to the original stimulus. So therefore the response is opposite to the original response. In contrast, we have positive feedback mechanisms as well. These aren't as common as our negative feedback mechanisms, and we do focus a lot more on the negative feedback mechanisms. But a positive feedback mechanism is one that reinforces or amplifies the situation that results in more of the same happening. So a perfect example of this is during childbirth. So as the baby is moving um, into the birth canal, the pressure of the baby's head on the uterus is the stimulus. This releases a chemical called oxytocin and then contractions begin to occur, which is the response. As the baby continues to push down on the opening of the uterus, more contractions take place and leads to the uterus to dilate or the cervix to dilate and then the baby is able to be born. So in the next little thing that we need to look at, which we'll be looking at a lot more uh, in detail in class, is a dot point gather, process and analyse information from secondary sources and use available evidence to develop a model for feedback mechanisms. So we need to be able to draw specific feedback loops looking at the stimulus response effectors, etc., for at least one specific uh, process that happens in the body. So here we have temperature and blood glucose level and as we can see they're a little bit different to the one that I showed you before as they have uh, a two-way sort of process or two-way pathway. So one shows what happens when there's an increase away from our homeostasis and one shows when there's a decrease. So we'll be having a look at these in a lot more detail in class and we'll be creating some together and then you'll be able to do some on your own and that's it for our first